and start the meeting. Let's rise for the pledge. Mrs. Perry, would you please call the roll? Dr. Hoida? Present. Dr. Gates? Here. Dr. McBride? Here. Mr. Perez is absent. Mr. Widman? Here. Item two, adopt the agenda. Please read the agenda and we'll need a motion. I do have an addendum and that is to add under item 8.03 on the consent agenda on employment we will be adding extended hours for Patricia Davis. And there are two corrections on page five. And this is also under 8.03 on the consent agenda for employment. At the bottom of page five, people activity contracts, Taylor Gillig cheerleading instead of ninth grade, that should be eighth grade and seventh grade for fall and winter. Joshua Roberts, Football assistant varsity volunteer should be removed. Any other corrections, Sharon? No, thank you. A motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Dr. McBride? Yes. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. Item three, acknowledgement of guests. Mr. Grubbs? I'd just like to welcome everyone tonight, especially our retirees who will be rec being recognized. And uh, this is our final night for our three uh, seniors who uh, were the board representatives this year, student representatives to the board. I want to really thank them. Um, I, I was just telling Elena a few minutes ago that in 22 years of uh, being in administration, they are the three best uh, student representatives I've seen. So great job and thank you for all your dedication. Item four, awards and recognition. Our first award or recognition is the Crystal Apple Award. Mr. Bose. Thank you, Dr. Hoyda. We need to uh, um, look at some unfinished business from last month uh, with our Crystal Apple Award winners. Uh, before we get to all of our retirements and recognitions there. Um, last month, Mr. Greg Bogard couldn't be with us, so we want to make sure that we recognize him tonight. Mr. Bogard, could you please come forward? <laughs> Mr. Bogard is our classified staff Crystal Apple Award recipient for the third quarter. Uh, he was nominated by Scotty Daniel and Mr. Jim Grubbs. Um, Greg has worked for Tiffin City Schools for the past 26 years. He is a graduate of Mohawk High School and Terra Tech College. His two-year certifications include heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Again, there's several different areas of, of uh, criteria that uh, the, the nominees are uh, based on. And under the area of teamwork, this is what Scotty and Jim had to say about Greg. Uh, everything Greg does requires teamwork. He supervises the maintenance department while working with all the custodians and night sweepers, plus with every secretary, teacher, and administrator across the district. Major repairs require several people from inside and outside the system to work together under good leadership and with good coordinated teamwork. Working together to accomplish more seems to be a strong work habit for Greg. In the area of commitment, Greg is committed to having the best school district possible. He is constantly planning future projects, ordering items needed on a daily basis, or calling for specialty repair parts, all while he is supervising the maintenance crew, the custodial staff, and the night sweepers. Greg does all this while watching costs and answering calls from people across the district. He keeps all the electrical, plumbing, and heating systems working in all the buildings. Plus, when we have a snowstorm, he is out plowing and salting our sidewalks and parking lots long before dawn. Only a person very committed and dedicated to Tiffin City Schools would continue the schedule day after day, including scheduled days off when necessary. In the area of leadership, Greg exhibits leadership as he manages his department. 
Greg assigns jobs to ensure specific repairs or jobs are completed in a timely fashion. He contacts substitutes when the custodians and night sweepers are off. He often oversees specialty projects set up like graduation, cross country events at the park, the district arts festival, and many, many more. This means getting equipment and supplies needed to the proper places and setting everything up, plus all the takedown afterwards. Greg shows leadership in a quiet manner with a gentle hand but very efficient method. Taking pride in his work, Greg is such a caring person, he wants every, everything to be perfect. Every project Greg touches is completed with a sense of pride and satisfaction for a job well done. When the buildings you, when the buildings you care for hold the community's young people, you want a person that is dedicated and takes pride in his work, such as Greg. And outstanding accomplishments, uh, Greg has completed training and licensure required as needed to complete his job. He is respected across the district when the question was asked of the staff within the district, what do you think about Greg? One quote always came back. And that is, Greg is willing to help us resolve our problems and we know he's only a phone call away. He is always willing to help and has always a smile on his face. Greg, congratulations on your award and thanks for all you do for Tiffin City Schools. We're very proud of you. I just want to say thank you to everybody. <laughs> Next will be Bob presenting for a list of retirees that we're entering. Yeah, uh, first off, we're going to have uh, Mr. Beeston. Bill, you want to come up and um, recognize your first uh, of two retirees in your building? All right, I don't believe my first person is here. Nancy Gase, is she here? Uh, Nancy actually retired last year and during a time when the world shut down, so she didn't get to get recognized, so we're gonna do that tonight. Uh, Nancy Gase retires from Tiffin City Schools after 11 years of service. After 20 plus years in the medical field, she became a parent volunteer at Crowd Elementary, assisting in the classroom and leading guided reading groups. Uh, this led to becoming a substitute aide working in different capacities at Kraut, Clinton, and the administration building. She eventually landed as an aide to students with special needs at Washington Elementary, and then became a full-time aide in the ED unit at Kraut Elementary until she retired. Crowd Elementary principal had to say that Nancy Gase was an integral part of the Crowd 2-3 staff. Her position asked her to work with some of the strongest behaviors in our school. Nancy not only never backed down from the challenge, but succeeded in every single one. She has a unique ability to get through to students, to build relationships with the students so that they have an outlet during difficult times and achieve optimal performance during positive times. Mrs. Gase is a team player who'd offer to assist any teacher, any student in the building, if if it was felt that her experience would help a situation. The students and staff of Crowd Elementary are blessed to call Nancy theirs. Nancy is married to her husband, Dave, and is proud to say she and her two sons are all graduates of Columbian High School. Her retirement plans include spending time at her happy place, which is Clinton Lake Campground, and spending time there with her family. She'll especially enjoy going to her grand grandchildren's school and sporting events. Nancy says she will miss the challenges, adventures, and friendships she made over the years at Tiffin City Schools. Uh, even though she's not here, I'd like to recognize right now Nancy, Mrs. Nancy Gase. And then next we'd like to recognize Mrs. Becky Trumbull. Mrs. Trumbull has been with Tiffin City Schools for 23 years, all of them at Kraut Elementary. Her titles have included intervention specialist, first grade teacher, second grade teacher, and now Tornado Academy advisor. Becky's been a permanent fixture at Kraut with her early morning arrivals, her late departures, and sometimes it seems as if she even spent her entire summer vacation at Kraut Elementary. She is one of the first to ask if anyone needs help and always goes the extra step. Uh, within our building, she's also known as the Recycling Queen, along with many other projects that she has spearheaded. Uh, Becky will be greatly missed by students and staff. Her retirement plans include turning off the alarm clock and traveling whenever she feels like it. She's made a positive impact on all that, all that know her and all the best to Becky in her retirement. Becky, congratulations. That is yours. Thank you. And this is yours also. 
Next up, we have uh, Mr. Scotty Daniel presenting to pre folks in his department. First up is Brenda Morrison. Hello. Brenda Morrison. Brenda began her career with Tiffin City Schools and Food Service Department in 1995. She spent 25 years serving the students with a smile and kind words. Over the years, she worked for 20 years at Clinton, Noble, and Washington Elementary buildings, as well as Central Kitchen at Columbian. Brenda enjoyed working in the buildings, but the elementary schools hold a special place in her heart. The last five years of her career was spent at the middle school. Brenda was always ready and willing to do anything asked of her. She had a wonderful laugh and everyone enjoyed working with her. Brenda is married to her husband, Tom, and has two children. She also has three grandchildren she loves and spending time with them. Among her hobbies are garage sales, camping, lighthouse, and hummingbirds. Brenda will be missed by the entire food service team and Tiffin City Schools. Brenda Morrison. Thank you. Rick Shellhammer has retired at Christmas time this past year, but due to COVID, we were unable to recognize him. So he's not here tonight, but I'm willing, we're still gonna go ahead and go recognize him. Rick Shellhammer is retiring after 18 years of dedicated service to Tiffin City Schools. Over the years, he has worked at Columbian, Tiffin Middle School, Noble, and Corral Buildings. Anyone who worked with Rick can attest to his extremely strong work ethic. Rick is a hard worker. Rick, Rick's wife, Deb, also retired from Tiffin City Schools, having worked in food service. The t they have two children and look forward to spending more time in retirement with their grandchildren. Rick also enjoys hunting. We will wish Rick the best in his retirement. Rick Schellhammer. Um, my next recognition is Mary Schneider, and she was unable to attend tonight. In February of 1991, a TCS bus made a stop and Mary Schneider got on. Since then, Mary has been a dedicated, dependable, and hardworking bus driver. And it is hard to imagine that over the course of her 30-year career, she has transported nearly 300,000 students to and from school. I am sure that Mary has made a lasting impression on each and every student that stepped onto her bus, but none more than on the coworkers that had the experience of working so closely with her. Just a few examples of many comments received about Mary include, Mary was always fun at the garage. We heard about how her cows and how her crops were growing. Mary has the biggest heart. She'll talk about her garden and all the stuff she's canned. Mary is a giver, very dedicated to her job and love of kids. Uh, when I first met Mary, she scared me, but I soon realized she was just a big teddy bear behind a, heart, a hearty laugh and a big smile. Whether, it's her, whether it be her unique morning greetings, her honest and bold opinions, or her infectious laugh, Mary will be de dearly missed. We wish her the best of luck while spending more time with her friends, family, and gardening. We look forward to her substitute bus driving this year. And she, yes, she's still doing that. Ms. Nikki Duran from Washington Elementary. So our first retiree is Nancy Burner. So Nancy was born and raised in New Regal, Ohio, and graduated from New Regal. She and her husband, Don, have two adult children and two grandchildren who attend Tiffin City Schools. Nancy began working for Tiffin City Schools in 1984, 34 school years ago. 37. 1984, 37. I, it's written 37, sorry. I, I get a little choked up because it's she's been, it's been all 37 years at Washington, too. So that's... A, Big impressment. Um, all of her years have been at Washington in the library with one year taking care of Noble's library and three years of sharing Kraut's library. Nancy was hired for the job after volunteering here in the library for three years. Marilyn Davis was a librarian overseeing six elementary libraries with an all volunteer staff. 
She wrote a proposal to have an aide at each school and Nancy was given the Washington position. During those three volunteer years, if any of the others couldn't make it, Nancy asked them to please call her. In Nancy's words, a librarian was what I wanted to be when I grew up. After being in education for 37 years, Nancy has had to change with the times. During the COVID closure, Nancy recorded videos daily of her reading stories that were then posted on her website. During our remote days, she not only rescheduled classes so they wouldn't miss out on their library times, but also Zoomed with the classes. She co coordinated our book fairs, participated in all of our family events, and is known for dressing as Fancy Nancy for Halloween. It is hard to put into words 37 years of service, other than to say she will be missed. Congratulations on your retirement. We also have Mary Swartz retiring. <laughs> Mary has worked for an aide for Tiffin City Schools for 30 years. She has worked at Kraut, Tiffin Middle School, Noble, and has finished her career at Washington. She has worn many hats over the years, including greeting the buses, lunch and recess duty, caring for students with diabetes, literacy aid, filling in for office personnel, and working as a one-on-one -on -one aide, to name a few. She does a great job at whatever she is assigned to do. Mary is dependable and is known for her attention to detail. While working as a literacy aide, Mary provided interventions for struggling readers, and she cheered them on and celebrated the students' growth. While at Washington, Mary took it upon herself to keep the lost and found organized and would lay out all of the lost items so they could be found. Any item that wasn't claimed was taken home by her, washed, and returned to our extra clothing bins. Mary coordinated our recycling efforts by taking the items to the recycling center herself. One of Mary's favorite things to do while at Washington was participate in the unit on apples in kindergarten. She brought in apples, strainer, peeler, and other supplies to make applesauce. She showed students the star in the middle of the apple and really immersed herself in the apple unit. Mary is looking forward to relaxing, riding her bike, and spending time with her four adult children and five grandchildren. We wish Mary the best in her retirement from the Tiffin City Schools. Next up is Jen Kuhn, Director of Teaching and Learning. Joan Ledwidge. I had the privilege of having a conversation, a few minutes, which led to an hour or so, and then writing her bio which I'm very proud of. Joan Ledwidge is a proud product of Tiffin City Schools who is able to boast several important things in regards to her educational career. She taught all but one year of her career in Tiffin City Schools. She is a BGSU alumni who upon her college graduation ventured to Columbus to be a preschool teacher. During her career with Tiffin City Schools, she has taught at Noble in third and fifth grade. In fact, she taught fifth grade for 20 years. Just prior to the reconfiguration of our elementary schools, Joan moved to Kraut to teach third grade and then decided second grade was perhaps an additional change that she needed in her career. Not one to shy away from things and with concerns related to the pandemic, she joined the Tornado Academy team this year to serve third through eighth grade students and I am ever so grateful that she did. Joan is known for enjoying life with a smile and a good laugh. You may have to ask a peer or two about some of her pranks she has pulled over the years. In fact, Joan did not discriminate when pulling her pranks as she was sure to include principals in her shenanigans at times. She and some of her peers knew that Mr. Mike Steyer was not a huge dog fan. So she organized an impromptu photo shoot in his office when he was out one day. The photo shoot included magic, sitting in Mr. Steyer's chair, wearing Mr. Steyer's glasses, with Mr. Steyer's lunch pail clearly in view. 
he was not amused. <laughs> on a more serious and professional side of things, Joan has served on the following committees over the years. Four levy committees, all of which passed. Curriculum committees for social studies and English, building leadership team, and the reorganization committee when it came time for the change from neighborhood schools to grade level band schools. She also spearheaded the 75th birthday party celebration for Noble as she had an emotional connection to the school as both her grandmother and her mother went to Noble. When asked some of her proudest moments as a teacher, she shared that she was extremely proud of being a part of the team that helped Noble reach Hall of Fame status with the Ohio Department of Education. Some of her favorite teaching moments included creating folk, tra folk trail kits for families to do at home as part of a grant she wrote to National Machinery. The families would do activities with their students, such as an archaeological dig, and of course, um, Sorry, yeah. Um, it, uh, Joan did many things in her career. She enjoyed doing activities with students. Um, they did an archaeological dig, and occasionally Joan was known to dress up as Ben Franklin or even Ricky Lake to capture students' attention. While Joan is an extremely dedicated teacher, she of course did find time to have a life outside of the classroom. She and her husband, Rob, have been married for 27 years and have two wonderful children, Andy and Jillian. In closing, I want to thank Joan for her 33 years of service to the students of Tiffin City Schools. I also want to leave you with some advice directly from Joan herself. Don't take yourself too seriously and find ways to enjoy what you do. Joan, enjoy yourself in all your future endeavors. Sean Murphy, Tiffin Middle School. Good evening, everyone. I have the privilege uh, to honor Karen Lucius. Karen was able to retire last year during the pandemic, and uh, certainly wanna, we want to bring her back and uh, recognize her years of service. So Karen has served the district for over 28 years in a variety of roles for the majority of her career, and most recently, she worked as an invaluable member of the TMS office secretary staff. Karen's responsibilities included managing student information, data entry, assisting with district and community communication, as well as office management, and so many other things, big and little, often quietly and behind the scenes that kept TMS running smoothly. Karen's professionalism, integrity, and patience have been a tremendous asset to Tiffin City Schools for nearly three decades. Karen feels she's been truly blessed to work with such caring and supportive colleagues in a community that embraces education. Over the years, Karen has gained fulfillment in assisting new students, and families with their transition to the middle school. She found great satisfaction alleviating some of the anxieties and fears that come with middle school years. One of her most memorable moments came when she observed two distinctly different students bumping into each other near her desk. One child was developmentally delayed and struggled with school, while the other boy was quite at ease in making friends and experiencing great success in school. The two exchanged greetings, and one boy told the other boy he would see him in phys ed class. Both young men went along with their day, However, Karen was impacted by that singular exchange as evidence of the great students who make up our district and community. While Karen will miss her job and her TMS family, she is excited to begin her next chapter and spend time reading, camping, traveling, visiting Amish country, but most importantly, spending time with her husband, Tom, her son, Kevin, daughter, Andrea, daughter-in-law, Christy, and her young grandsons, Jack and Elliot. Karen's family is honored to express their deep admiration, love, and pride for her and her career accomplishments with TMS. Karen's daughter recalls a conversation she had with her mom back in the 1990s when a colleague of Karen's resigned and a party was thrown. She asked Karen if TMS would throw a party for her when she left, and Karen dismissed the idea, saying it was only for people who had been there for a while and who had made a big impact. Her daughter was absolutely certain in the moment that her mom was mistaken, that she had already had a positive and lasting impact on the school, and that her mom would be similarly, similarly celebrated someday. While circumstances no one could have predicted, 
dictated a more unique farewell from TMS staff, it remains a time of celebration for all who have had the good fortune to know Karen personally or professionally. As we wish Karen all the best in retirement, we would like to share how she will be remembered. Karen will be remembered as a high character individual who embodies kindness, thoughtfulness, and appreciation for all people. She was a tremendous asset to the TMS office staff as her positive attitude, dedication, and work ethic were second to none. Karen, on behalf of the T Tiffin City District, we wish you all the best in retirement. Good to see you. So the, the second person I'd like to honor today is Deb Moon. Deb Moon can't be with us, but she's uh, retiring from a library media specialist position. Uh, she started working for Tiffin City Schools 29 plus years ago. Now, now I want to share, this is from the perspective of uh, a trusted colleague and also a friend, Nat Perrin. So she wanted to share her perspective uh, on, how, on how Deb has impacted her. So nonetheless, started working for Tiffin City Schools 29 years ago, um, and Nat wasn't even in the country yet. It took more than a decade later for us to meet. I first met Deb at the Tiffin Middle School Library where she recently retired from the library position. She was the first person that made me feel like I was part of the school. To be sincerely grateful, she was the first person in my professional education career that made me feel like I actually had a friend at work. Through the years, Deb shared stories of her life with me. Her delightful talks about her husband, David, her kids, Jason, who is a research supervisor at a pharmaceutical company, Rachel, who's a first grade teacher at Washington Elementary, and Dr. Jonah, who is a neuro, neuroradiologist for Columbus Radiology, and also her seven grandchildren. All these experiences allowed me to see a proud mother and grandmother who cares deeply about her family. Since I had met her later in her professional career, Deb and I have to, had a conversation about where, where she was before we met. Here's what she told me. Deb started out as a secretary to the curriculum director, Larry Hedden, and the director of operations, Jake Martin. After that, she was transferred to Lincoln Elementary as a library aide, and when the new TMS building was built, she was asked to take a position of, tech, uh, of technology. During these years, she had to take the role of an MH aide for two years, and finally she came back to TMS as a library tech person. My role and her role at the schools are not generically intersected. The only place we shared is the TMS library, where, where it will from now on be a place of good memories for me. Congratulations on your retirement, Deb. Mike Newlove, Noble Elementary. I'd like to recognize Kim Contact. Ms. Kimberly Contact is a 1979 graduate of Shawnee High School in Lima, Ohio. Kim received an associate degree in medical assisting from the University of Toledo in 1982. While a student there, she met her husband, Dan, and they were married in the fall after graduating. Mrs. Contact has faithfully served the Tiffin City School District for 25 years. She began her career in the district in 1996. Kim first worked as an aide serving in Bloomville, Washington, and Lincoln Elementary Schools, as well as Tiffin Middle School. Following this, she moved to the administration building and served as a receptionist under Superintendent Denise Callahan for five years. In February 2003, she made her final move in the district and became the secretary at Noble Elementary School, where she has remained for the past 18 years. Kim has always taken pride in her work, accomplishing her tasks in a professional and organized manner. She has been recognized for her service by receiving the Youth Asset Builder Award and the TCS Crystal Apple Award. Being a team player, she will miss working with the administration, staff, students, and families of Tiffin City Schools, and in particular, Noble 4-5 Elementary School. They will always hold a special place in her heart. Mrs. Contact, however, does look forward to retirement. She intends to spend more time with her husband, Dan, who is also retiring this summer. She also plans to see her grandchildren and daughters who live in the Columbus area 
a great deal more. Mrs. Contact, I will personally miss you so much. Uh, you are a right hand to a principal, and I wish you the best. Thank you. This is Marilyn Sislo from Calvert Catholic Schools. Good evening, everyone. Darlene Shook began her career at St. Mary's School in 1983 under the guidance of Father Ray Ensman. A short time after she started running the office, Ted Rombeck became principal and they worked side by side for the next 23 years. Ted and Darlene developed a long lasting friendship that still exists today. Darlene was instrumental in supporting Ted as well as all the teachers, students, and parents who belonged to the school. To this day, she still gets Christmas cards from former students and parents thanking her for the impact she has had on their lives. Everyone knew they could depend on Darlene for help with something going on in school, but more importantly, they could trust her with the important things going on in their personal lives as well. She was a gifted listener and always made you feel like you were the most important person in the room. There was very much a family feeling at St. Mary's and a lot of that had to do with Darlene. She was the glue that held everyone together. Whether we were rejoicing or grieving, Darlene was right there in the middle making everything better. One of her favorite memories of St. Mary's would be the practical jokes, especially the wax Reese cups made out of melted crayons and the chocolate styrofoam cakes that Judy Hall used to pull on just about everyone. Darlene also became the ASP clerk through Tiffin City during that time and has held that position for 35 years. When St. Mary's and St. Joe's consolidated, Darlene transitioned over to become the secretary of St. Joseph Elementary, which later became Calvert Elementary. She has continued in that role since then. I have been blessed to be able to work with Darlene as principal the last three years, but I've also been able to work with her the past 33 years. So I can speak highly of all the things that she's done to change the culture of Calvert Elementary School. Uh, one of her most favorite parts of her job would be getting to spend her days in school together with her children and grandchildren who attended Calvert. She has three sons, Jeffrey and Jenny, Eric and Jen, and Brian and Hudna, and 11 grandchildren. Uh, I have to name them all. Aaron, Jeffrey, Bella, Keaton, Riley, Jacob, Troy, Cameron, Mackenzie, Dominic, and Mason, and three great-grandchildren, Aiden, Aaron, Jr., and Braley. She and her husband, Jeff, who is here tonight, have been married for 48 years. Darlene spends, plans to spend time with her family and hopefully do a little bit of traveling, and she knows that I love her with all my heart, and she will be sorely missed. Congratulations, Darlene. Forrest Trisler, Columbia High School. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have two honorees from last year that are unable to attend. The first is Jerry Baker. Jerry Baker retired from Tiffin City Schools in 2020 after 33 years of service. Jerry started working in the Bloomville building in 1987. After Bloomville closed, he went to work at Clinton. After Clinton closed, he worked uh, at Kraut and then came to Columbian High School in 2020 as the head custodian. Mr. Baker was a staff member and student staff and student favorite, I should say, as he created an easy rapport with everyone that he met. With his cheerful heart, he often went the extra mile for students, bringing in decorations at Christmas time to help brighten the hallways at TC. He bought and planted flowers in the courtyard and out in front of the building by the sign to make sure the building looked at its best, especially at graduation. Uh, it was these gestures that endeared him to many at Tiffin Columbian. He truly went above and beyond for the students and staff of Columbian High School. Jerry worked this past season a part-time job with UPS since retiring. 
He will help uh, the Baker family with farming, and he hopes to enjoy more travel time with his wife, Peggy, while they're visiting their daughter. Mr. Baker would like to thank the Board of Education and Administration for allowing him to be part of the Tiffin City School District. If Jerry was here, I would tell Jerry that he's not a Colombian treasure. In fact, he's a Tiffin City Schools treasure. Karen Swope. Mrs. Karen Swope retired after 27 years of service to the students at Tiffin City Schools. She completed her student teaching at Columbian High School under Mrs. Betty Cunningham after she graduated from Bowling Green State University. She was a stay-at-home mother for many years teaching fitness classes in the evenings at the YMCA. When her youngest son began first grade, she began working at Washington Elementary as an educational aide and continued in that capacity for three years. In 1996, she began her career as the family consumer science teacher at Columbian High School. Students have enjoyed Mrs. Swope's classes where they learned important life skills and her classes always filled quickly. The staff will miss her unwavering presence in the classroom and hallways at Columbian. She was a very organized and detail-oriented teacher, and I would remark she's one of the finest teacher leaders that I've worked with uh, during my career. In retirement, Karen uh, is enjoying baking, boating with her husband John on Lake Erie, and spending time with her children, Aaron, Amy, Jamie, as well as her grandchildren. This brings us to this year's Columbian High School uh, honoree, Miss Ann Reddy. Anna's retiring from the Tiffin City School District after a 36-year career in education. Throughout her childhood, she attended seven different school systems, including those in Havelock, North Carolina, Fairfax County, Virginia, Newport, Rhode Island, Naples, I'm sorry, Naples, Italy, and Portsmouth, Virginia, until landing at Virginia Tech for both her bachelor's in English and master's in curriculum and instruction after she started teaching. Through her experience, or through this experience, and being the daughter of a United States Marine Corps father and a public school teacher mother, she gained the insight into how schools work. She started teaching because she wanted to improve the system. Anne's career started at the middle school, where she student taught in Dublin, Virginia, and spent nine years as an eighth grade English teacher. She was also then the yearbook advisor, drama director, and volleyball coach. It was at Dublin Middle where she started to learn how to teach English to middle schoolers. She learned to tap into their enthusiasm. In Fairfax County, Anne worked with one of the largest school systems in the country and worked with the Central Office Curriculum Development Department. It was there she learned how to teach with other teachers for bigger goals. She learned how to work with others and that working with others creates enthusiasm. Anne moved to Ohio in 1993 and started a family while working at North Baltimore schools. Again, she was the volleyball and softball coach, drama director, and yearbook advisor. At North Baltimore, she attended the University of Toledo to become, cert become a certified library media specialist. It was there that she learned how to overcome student, uh, I'm sorry, overcome teaching resistant students. She learned that hard circumstances can lead to greater connections with students and deeper learning. Finally, Anne landed at TCHS and has been here for the past 18 years. And again, she's frantically working uh, on the yearbook as she took over as our co-yearbook advisor uh, this year with our transition to Life Touch. And the yearbook's coming along well, and we're very excited, and the students are very excited. Um, it was here where she learned how to work with persistence despite the ever-changing circumstances. She learned that remaining steadfast in her determination to promote literacy and help students develop a love of reading takes time, effort, and perseverance. But it works. She has, uh, has learned that the best leadership is shared leadership and the only job that we have is to help students love to learn. In her retirement, Anne will be living at her new house uh, at the Outer Banks of North Carolina. She plans uh, on walking to the beach and swimming in the ocean every day. Uh, she will remain connected with education through substitute teaching. She plans to make art, eat fresh fish, read books like it's her job, and surf, but not necessarily all in those order. Congratulations, Anne.
Next, we have Tim Weber, Technology Thank Department. You. I would like to invite uh, Jane Distel up to the podium. I didn't write it. I know you didn't. I did. Where do I begin to describe Jane Distel? There's so many facets to this individual. To some that are new to the district, she has been a soothing voice on the telephone, a smiling face to those she's helped either in our technology office, the high school, or in the administration building. Jane has welcomed everyone into our office with a smile and a jar of mints sitting on her desk. But only take one. With the phones ringing and the swinging of the hallway door and a parent in the courtyard door knocking to get our attention, Jane's multitasking abilities can only be compared to that of a nurse practitioner in a trauma unit. To really know Jane, you see that she cares from her heart. Her family, family comes first and it shows. The pictures line her desk and the walls and it always has been this way. Her husband of over 40 years, Tim, has been her rock and she has been his as well. She brings her lunch on occasion or drops off the keys and he's always, <clears throat> and he always has one of their two grandchildren, either Sean or Grant, there to say hello to Yaya or give her a hug and they whisper to her, come home. She is so proud of Samantha and Aaron for the parents that they have become. When it comes to talking about her son, Zach, I remember how proud she was when he graduated from college and found his job at Louisville, Kentucky at the museum. And every time they plan a trip to go see him or when he comes home, she can't stop talking about him, but I still enjoyed listening. Samantha, <laughs> Samantha, her daughter, is so proud of her accomplishments, particularly when it came to her graduating from Tara. It wasn't just that she had gotten her degree, she worked so hard to reach her goal and set such an amazing example for her being such a hardworking mom. She still does this every day. She gives herself and her faith, her community, whether it's organizing retreats or lending an ear, it's from her heart. She loves her family, including her siblings and her Buckeyes. <laughs> and it shows. Jane and I have worked together since 2005 We've seen people leave our department, and now they're starting to come back. <laughs> we have had stressful times, worked in a lot of worn out equipment. We've tried to keep the network going through floods, power failures, extreme cold spells, and now we can add pandemics. Now our districts are far better off than they were five years ago. Jane has played a big part in this, and I'm grateful to have had her as a coworker. I will miss her morning coffees and our lunches too, but I know that Jane can now focus on her passion with her family time. It's time to reboot yourself, Jane Distel, <laughs> and enjoy the life you deserve. Our final final recipient is Mrs. Brenda Ehrenfried, and I don't think Brenda could make it this evening. Um, so we certainly want to recognize her. Brenda Ehrenfried was an educational aide and will be retiring after more than 35 years of service to Tiffin City Schools. Brenda started her career as a secretary at East Junior High from June 1973 to April 1977. After taking time to raise her family, Brenda returned to TCS on June 17, 1991 as an educational aide. During her tenure, Mrs. Ehrenfried has been responsible for maintenance of students' health care screening records. Brenda served a variety of roles which include kindergarten registration, hearing vision screener, management of immunization records, library aid, and playground lunchroom monitor. Brenda's most significant contributions to TCS are not singular events. Instead, it is the culmination over many years of caring and dedication to students. 
For Brenda, students always, always come first. Brenda lives with her husband, Gary, a local business owner. Together, they have been married for 45 years, raising three children, Charlie, Julie, and Lori. Brenda looks forward to traveling, attending Ohio State sporting events, and most importantly, spending time with her eight beautiful grandchildren. Mrs. Aaron Freed's caring and outgoing personality will be missed by the students and staff. The TCS family wish to thank Brenda for her many years of service and enjoy a happy, well-deserved retirement. Congratulations, Brenda. <laughs> Dr. Hoyt, as we wrap this up for our retirees, you know, I, I, I think just spitballing the numbers, we're looking at over 300 years of service and experience 400 years? 488 years of experience. 488 years. So we, we certainly thank all of you. I mean, your shoes, I don't want to say are going to be hard to fill um, because you can never refill shoes with the quality of people that each and every one of you are. So thank you for your years of service. We certainly appreciate all you've done and we're certainly gonna miss you. All right, congratulations to all of you. Thank you. I'd like to personally thank all of us. Your retirees, congratulations, and enjoy your retirement. At this time, we'd like to honor our student board representative. Our first representative is going to be Elena Hayes, and she's gonna be honored. Oh, Chris is gonna go first, I'm sorry. Chris is gonna go first. And he's going to honor Jory Fawcett. I didn't really No, you're fine. Second will be Megan with Jory Fawcett. So, Jory, I'll bring this over to you in just a second, but I want to say a few things. Um, stepping into a leadership role, uh, you didn't just do it here. You also did it in the, the community. Um, and you have stood as an advocate for equity and inclusion. Um, you've given robust reports each time you've been here, uh, inclusive of all students and all experiences. One of my personal favorite things um, to look for has been um, the paper that you have been editor on. And your work has been exceptional, um, reaffirming the strength and the insight of student voices. Um, and just as something that my daughter will later kill me for, so we're just gonna hope that she's not watching, is that um, you've been a true role model even when you didn't know. Um, and there are students who watch you and look up to you. My daughter is one of them. You have a fan club you're probably not even aware of. Um, and we are fortunate to have had you here. So thank you for, for all you've done and all that you've brought to the board. Thank you. Hi. Okay. And our third student member, Trevor Blodgett, Dr. Gaster. I think I'll say a few words about Trevor. Um, so uh, I've known Trevor since he was born. Um, and um, Trevor's probably one of the only people I know that at three years of age, he would sit in the Columbian football stadium and he would know the players. He would know the plays uh, at three. Not, not, you know, just paying attention, he knew what was going on. And uh, I thought for sure he was gonna be a sports announcer um, because he was so, he knew statistics, he knew numbers, he knew everything. And, uh, but he's also gifted in a lot of other things. And, uh, so he'll be attending University of Toledo, astronomy and data science, yeah. So I mean, uh, so basically he's gonna be like, uh, you know, plan our trips to Mars. At least the team's plan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Student representatives, congratulations on your graduation. Is there anything you'd like to say to us or the public? Um, first, thank you to Dr. McBride. Um, it with the tip inning, it wouldn't be possible without Elena here who served as the assistant editor. Um, 
uh, we had a great staff this year. Um, a lot of great underclassmen are going to be coming up. Going to be sad to leave, but um, there's a lot of more talent coming. Uh, to the rest of the board, thank you for having us here. Um, definitely was a big privilege of mine to be able to showcase so many wonderful students, not only in Columbian, but the entire district. Um, we definitely have some really great students, and I'm excited to see what the future holds for the district. And uh, part of the reason that I wanted to join the board is to see how things work because it's really easy to criticize something from the outside without actually knowing how it works. Because the easy part is calling for change. The hard part is actually going about it. And I think with my time on the board, I now know how it works to get change done in the school district and how it is to run a school district. And I think that's important for a lot of people. If you ever want to bring about change or want to be educated on the topic, you must experience it. And I don't think that would have been possible without my position as a student representative here. And now I think in the future when I have problems that I want to get brought up at school board meetings, when I have things that I think can be done better about our education department, I know exactly how those things work because it's hard. It's hard to be here. It's hard to bring out change education. And now I know that you need levies, you need money, you need agreement. And all of that stuff is really hard to get. And now I feel more educated on that topic. And I feel like now if I want to do this again in the future, if I want to get elected in whatever community I'm serving in, I feel like I will have the proper knowledge to actually bring about that change. And that wouldn't have been possible without being here on the board and having board uh, members who take you in and value your opinion. Because honestly, I didn't know how it would go with our board members, but each and every one of them came up to me at my first meeting and said, we just want you to know that your opinion is valued and we want you to share your opinion. And I thought that was amazing. And I just want to thank everyone for my opportunity to serve on the board. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you for giving me this position. Um, it's offered me a lot of perspective and like an inside look at what really goes on behind the scenes. Um, and it's also given me um, the opportunity to recognize a bunch of students that sometimes aren't recognized as much because there's a lot of different awards and things that go on at Columbian. Um, but having this position has just made it a lot easier for those students to get some kind of recognition. So thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone. At this time, we'll ask Mr. Trisler to give us a presentation on Columbia. Well, good evening, members of the board. After getting through this year, uh, the pandemic year and all of its challenges, um, we've had a great year at Columbian High School in spite of the pandemic uh, and its challenges. And uh, as I thought about how we were going to present our highlights uh, from the year here at Columbian High School, uh, after seeing how strong our three school board representatives are, um, I decided there was no better way than to do that and have them join me in this. Um, so we're going to run this just like a newscast, uh, and, and we're going to hand off to our correspondents in three different areas. Uh, I guess to, to start the year, um, we made changes. We evolved, we stayed flexible, and we met the needs of our learners and the needs of our teachers uh, to get uh, us off to a successful start. Our enrollment at Columbian this year face-to-face -face was 612 students. Uh, our enrollment uh, at the Tornado Academy uh, online was 235 students, and we made things work for our 847 uh, students uh, so that they could be successful. Um, the vision and mission, in spite of the pandemic at Columbian High School, did not change. Diploma Plus accept acceptance and having something for everyone at TC was still our focus, even though 
we had to change uh, maybe the, the delivery of how to reach our students. Uh, our year 13 program continued. Our GPS program is in its third year of success and is continuing to grow. And uh, our, our bridging readiness uh, for after graduation, our BRAG program, uh, is continuing to thrive uh, with uh, giving students the opportunity to transition to work-based learning. Uh, and our work with Northwest Career Ready continues to progress. So in that short introduction, I wanted to give you a feel for where we were at at Columbian High School at the end of this pandemic year. And now, Elena Hayes will be our academics and visual arts correspondent. Okay. <clears throat> um, so a lot has happened this year in the art department. Um, I wanna first thank Mr. Schmitz, Mrs. Humphrey, and Mrs. Paradiso for their hard work in collectively growing the arts at Columbian. Um, the first competition that a majority of the students entered this year was the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards competition. Um, Calista Morrison and Whitney Johnson received honorable mentions for their pieces, and Elena Hayes received a gold award um, and advanced to the national competition. Later in the year, everyone submitted pieces to the state art show, the Governor's Show. We had four regional winners that advanced to the final state judging, Lucy Smothers, Elena Hayes, Whitney Johnston, and Emma Fleck. Um, and then also over this year, there were some individual entries in different competitions. Anna Sherwood entered a charity art contest and won a $250 scholarship for her piece on the harm water pollution has on animals. And Calista Morrison placed third at the Congressional Art Show, receiving high honors. Each artist did something special this year, and the art program is in good hands for years to come. Um, next, I will speak on academics. Um, here at Columbian High School, all academics are taken very seriously and put above all else. Over a week ago was the 2020-2021 recognition night for, these, for those students who have excelled in their academics and received scholarships. Congratulations to those seniors that received the Presidential Excellence Award and the Presidential Achievement Award. Um, Faith Abrams, Trevor Blodgett, Maggie Braymeyer, Jack Burkholder, Brian Edmond, Caleb Enders, Bishop Florence, Nathan Harple, Ethan Hart, Braxton Hockley, Toria Ingalls, Aaron Musel, Maddie Pohl, and Anna Steffi. Um, Alex Hosman received the English Math and Science Department Awards, Maggie Braymeyer received the World Language Department Award, and Jory Fawcett received the Social Studies Department Award. This year has been a great one for breaking barriers in academics, especially since the continuous effects of COVID-19. What I have mentioned here today is just a small portion of what students at Columbia have achieved. The students and staff are constantly working to better themselves in the environment we learn and grow in. Elena, thanks. Elena, thanks for a great year. We appreciate you giving us an update on academics and visual art. I appreciate that you always do things right and that you're a leader. Good luck in the future. <laughs> Next, we have Jory Fawcett to report on the performing arts and clubs at Columbian. A great, um, a great thing about Columbian is there are so many clubs for students to get involved in. And a special thing about that is all of those clubs find a way to serve the community outside of Columbian in some way. So um, this year, Student Council and National Honor Society teamed up for quite a few projects, including a food drive back in December, and 875 items were donated to um, like a combined effort to Salvation Army, First Step, and Fish. Um, and then with the key clubs, students worked all year on service projects for the good of the Tiffin community. Um, they donated blankets for the Morrison House in January. And um, uh, at the end of April, $200 was raised for the Children's Miracle Network through a coin, for, through a coin drive. Um, and as uh, Dr. McBride and I spoke earlier of, of the Tiffinian, um, that was brought back by, by a collective effort of students back in 2019, um, after about 20 years away. So about 20 years ago, it was cut and some really dedicated students brought it back and it's been active for three years. Um, there's currently 12 staff writers, hopefully that'll grow next year under the direction of um, advisor Miss Kaylee Cottom. And then as for um, visual arts, not to take away from the achievements of our uh, academics and our athletics, but I do wanna highlight something. Um, our athletics are very high performing, broken a lot of school records this year, but something that's been very disappointing for a lot of our um, performers is the lack of opportunity to perform. And due to the pandemic, um, we went two straight years without a musical performance, and that was really heartbreaking for a lot of the students. Um, they wait all year. Uh, perform really, uh, practice really hard, wait all year, and that didn't happen for two straight years. So hopefully we see that coming back next year. And um, for the choir, Mrs. Kim Ridge has done a fantastic job this year, making sure that we have the opportunity to perform. We did have to wait all year, um, 
but for, thankfully we had a concert um, a couple weeks ago. So the seniors could um, have one last performance before they left us. Um, so I think that what I would like to end with is the importance of funding the arts and the importance of supporting the art department and the performing art department. Because for some students, that's the only opportunity they get to um, shine in Colombian, perform in Colombian. So um, going forward, just remember the importance of funding the arts. Thanks, Jory, and we appreciate your service. Thanks for being a leader and all you've done bringing back uh, the Tiffinian. Uh, I am most proud of the steps and the strides and the excellence that you all have done this year. Uh, May was Art Month at Columbian High School. I know some of our board members were with us and got to walk the halls, uh, but very, very proud uh, of our visual artists and their work um, so that we could do a, a, a show for them. Uh, May was Art Month and their, their work uh, brightened the halls uh, of Columbian uh, for this whole month. Finally, we've got Trevor Blodgett with our athletics update. So to start this off, I'd like to say a little thanks to uh, Mr. Hartzell because with, when it comes to getting athletic updates, he makes it pretty easy on me. I was getting a list of like emails that I, or teachers that I have to email and advisors and stuff. And then Mr. Trisler just says, go see Hartzell. Walk right in. He says, I got it taken care of. I get an email the next day that has everything that I need. Uh, he makes this pretty easy for me. And I'm kind of the, I'm kind of the voice here, but he's kind of the brains of this operation. But um, anyways, to start our athletic updates, football had a great season, finished as a top four team in Division Three, and was defeated in the state semifinal by Chardon, and that's the farthest that a Colombian football team has ever advanced. Volleyball finished third in the SBC, and their season ended at districts. Boys cross country was SBC runner-up, and girls cross country was back-to-back -back SBC champions. Boys basketball finished the season at 20-4 and, and lost to Toledo Central Catholic in the district finals. That was the best overall record in Colombian basketball history, and Coach Kin was Division II Coach of the Year. Bowling, the boys ended the season at districts, and Danielle Rosenbauer was a lone girl to compete at districts. Swimming, the girls' relay team season ended at districts. Cole Eisenhower was a lone male and swimmer to compete at state. He finished sixth in the 50 free and 12th in the 100 free. Wrestling, finished sixth at district, Four wrestlers advanced the state tournament, those being C.J. Poole, Brett Minnick, Brody Conley, and Maddox Simcoe. And Brody Conley was a state champion for Columbia, and that is the second state champion for wrestling in Colombian's history. The baseball team recorded 20 wins for the second time in school history and recently won a sectional championship the other night. Tennis boys team finished as SBC champions, going 5-1 and one at SBCs. Brian Cecil advanced the district for singles. Trey Shuey and Jacob Weingart advanced in doubles. For softball, the team finished the season 15 and three. For track and field, and I have boys and girls combined in this report, the four by 100 team broke the school record for the girls consisting of Conti, Fiesel, Bree Meyer, and Davis. And Toria Ingles broke the high jump record. The boys track team finished third overall at SBCs. Champions for them include Keyshawn Jackson in the 100 who broke the school record in that event. He was also a champion in the 200. Caden Groves was the 1600 champion and the four by four team also won SBCs consisting of Kidwell, Reeves, Corpor, and Jackson. And last, uh, lastly, I have girls soccer. Broke, broke the girls soccer record for most wins in a season and also became the first girls soccer team to advance to round two of the playoffs. And then for some reason at the end of my athletics report, I have that Chris Monsoor was the Shine FM teacher of the week. I don't know why that's on the bottom of my athletics report, but it's worth mentioning. Trevor, thanks so much for including Mr. Mansoor as well. Uh, Trevor, appreciate uh, all your leadership and the, the, the great role model and tone that you set uh, at, uh, at, you know, at, at Columbian High School as well. Uh, board, we truly have had three uh, excellent and outstanding representatives. I wanted to make sure they were involved in bringing the highlights to you and also uh, getting the opportunity to bring them back uh, one more time all together for you. Um, what you've heard tonight uh, is certainly not an exhaustive list uh, of, of accomplishments, but we've had a really good year in a tough year, and I'm really proud of our students, our student board members, our student body, uh, and most of all, I'm proud of our teachers. Um, you know, things have looked different this year. We've made them work and we've made some new memories. And there's highlights to the year, uh, like our outdoor fall band concert and our outdoor uh, spring band concert um, that to me uh, are just as special as some of the other things um, that, that, that we've done in the past because kids get to showcase their talents in different ways. Um, you know, I, I think 
for me as a high school principal, the thing that most impresses me about uh, our students uh, and, and our staff uh, and, and you all and as a board of education and our administrators is that here in Tiffin, we strive for excellence and we strive uh, to make a difference in the lives of others daily. Um, our students excel, uh, and I've said this before, they excel with the best uh, of the rest in Ohio. Um, our students this year are attending Vanderbilt, Belmont, BYU, Ohio State, Miami, Heidelberg, Tiffin, and so many other fine universities. Um, our future uh, is, is really bright. We've had a great year. And, I, and I'm proud of all we've done, but our future's, future's even more bright. Looking forward to our rising seniors uh, and, and all the things that are in store for us in 21-22. And to just leave you on a, on a teaser for what's in store next year, um, three of our rising seniors, John Bailey, Jacob Warnham, I'm sorry, Jacob Weingart, and Leslie Daniel, they have all qualified for recognition in some form in the National Merit Semifinals, uh, sub, National Merit Scholarship Competition. Uh, we truly have great students, uh, great families, and a great teaching staff, and I look forward to seeing all the great things to come uh, next year after the year we've had this year. Uh, it'll be tough to top. Thanks so much. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone, and nice report, students, and Mr. Cooper, keep up the good work at the high school. Moving on, item six, committee report. First committee, business advisory, Dr. Hayes. The uh, business advisory uh, uh, council, uh, otherwise now known as uh, Northwest Career Ready, <clears throat> did not meet, but we did, um, uh, Amy Wood set out an update on each of the three um, committees. Uh, Leadership and Governance, uh, and David Zach is the head of that. Uh, Workplace-based learning, Jen Lusby is the head of that, and communication and engagement. And um, the, it's a rather complex uh, um, undertaking that we've got uh, with uh, uh, some 80 members of our committee now. Uh, um, and so I think it's, um, uh, Amy's doing a tremendous job of integrating these uh, uh, different uh, groups and uh, they're bringing uh, the, each of the uh, expertise to each of those committees. Uh, I'm really impressed with some of the work that's being done and uh, looking forward to uh, more reports uh, to come. Dr. Gase, were you done? I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanted to report out in regards to our extended learning opportunities. Um, we have our summer 2021 extended learning opportunity for K through eight students. Presently, we have 104 students signed up. We're running four different sessions. In session number one, we have 62 students. Uh, session number two, there are 34 students. Session three, there are 35, and session four, there are 43. Um, for these four sessions, um, Randy Conger and Trudy Margraff really need to be commended. Um, they are going out of their way to make sure that we're able to provide transportation and meals for these students. Um, I know it's a lot of extra work, um, but they always put kids first, and I really appreciate that. Um, on the high school side of things, we're offering a summer credit recovery program. Presently, we have 21 students who have signed up for that program. Um, a few of them are waiting to see if perhaps they pass their courses and do not need to do the credit recovery. Um, classes that it looks, that it appears they'll be needing to take are Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Biology, English 11, English 9, Geometry, World History, um, there appears to be an honors English, um, a government, and a physical science need. Um, our plan for that program is that those students will attend at Columbian um, for seven weeks, eight o'clock to four o'clock, Monday through Thursday. Um, and on Fridays, they work from home. Um, and we will have a staff member on site to guide them and support them in their learning. Um, there's a few things we need to work through. We've had contact with some parents with concerns about um, perhaps court orders where students are supposed to go visit out of state with family. Um, we also understand that there's vacation. 
Um, so we're going to be meeting, I think, tomorrow. Um, my personal opinion is a lot of these students struggled with passing a class in class, and they obviously, if they were online, struggled with passing a class online. It would be irresponsible of us if we were to offer an online class without the in-person support. Um, but we will discuss that further. And for those families who have those extenuating circumstances, we will have an answer ready for them. Um, in regards to next school year, our Tornado Academy, um, presently we have 116 students who have applied um, for acceptance into the academy. Um, the Tornado Academy is uh, reviewing those applicants to see were they engaged in their lessons this year, did they have passing grades, and then we're also double checking with um, related services or direct services being provided for students who are on IEPs um, to make sure that they were fully engaged in those therapies and different things. Again, we wanna make sure that every student in Tiffin City is given an opportunity to learn, but we also wanna make sure that we're giving them, them the best learning environment that meets their needs. Um, families will be made aware of their acceptance in um, early to mid-June. So, any questions? Yeah, um, Jen, how many of the, the K through eight children uh, signed up for all four sessions? You always ask the tough questions, Dr. Hoida. Um, I'd have to go back and look. Um, there were several. I would say there was probably at least, probably between 10 and 15 students that did that. Um, and usually if it was in a family, you would see consistency in that family. Um, but there were also families who would sign up for three sessions. Okay. So I think families did a really nice job of trying to balance what's gonna be best for my student academically and what's gonna be best for my student emotionally and taking into account when is my student gonna need a break and, in and their learning. I'm sorry, did you, did you say like, um, and do you have a breakdown of the grades at all? Absolutely, I do. Okay, very good. Uh, kindergarten, we have 20 students, first grade, 20 students, second grade, 12 third grade 17, fourth grade seven, fifth grade five, sixth grade 10, seventh grade five, eighth grade eight. And what are, what are the hours of that academy? That academy is eight to four, um, and it okay. is a Monday through Thursday. Okay. And it should be known in either of those two groups, we are not having school on Friday, July, is that second? Yeah, Friday, July 2nd, or Monday, July 5th. So they have a longer weekend there. So, Very good. thanks for your work. Yep. Thank Question, you. Jen. Yeah. On the uh, credit recovery, um, that's all seven weeks. That's Monday through Thursday, also. It's Monday through Thursday, with the expectation that the student works from home on Friday, okay. and then we'll have staff members to support them on Friday. So, so correct me if I'm wrong. Each of these that basically has one uh, class that they're going to take, or is there more than? It depends upon the student. They could take multiple classes, but it is going to take a high level of motivation right. probably to make it through all of that coursework in that period of time to and gain those credits. How many hours of that day are they in that one subject? It, it depends on how many hours they're, like how many courses they're taking. Yeah. We would help them in prioritizing their time. Okay, so. That's what we would do. Yeah, but they're, they're gonna be at the school eight to four? Yes. Yep. And then um, not eight to four. I'm sorry, eight to noon. Oh, okay. <laughs> eight long, to noon. Like, wow, I'm like eight to four. No, no. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Yeah. So okay. Both, both of them are eight to noon. I don't know where four okay, came all right, from. That's fine. I just want to make sure I was. I was like, I was trying to envision how yeah. that would look. And that, no. It'd be some very no. burnout people. I very think. forward thinking, but no, 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 okay. no on so, the four o'clock. And then the last question, uh, Tornado Academy. So yes. Of the, you said one sixteen. Yes. How many of those uh, did Tornado Academy this year? Uh, that I'd have to go back and check to see. I'm not sure. Okay, so you, but the majority of them will have had some Tornado Academy experience. Yes, the there? majority of them have had Tornado Academy experience, um, but there are several kindergartners who obviously would not have had experience right. that are joining our program. Okay. So um, the largest amount of, the largest group of students who are requesting Academy services are our high school students, so. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other questions?
Thank you, Jen. Finance Committee. Sharon, would you like to give that report? Um, sure. The Finance Committee met on Tuesday, May 18th, and um, we spent the entire hour reviewing the five-year forecast update, and I will be presenting that later on this agenda. So we'll talk about that then. Thank you. Uh, on down to district leadership team. Back to McBride. Sure. So this was our first district leadership team that met in person. We met on May 4th at the high school, and I have to say it was my favorite meeting. Um, one, just to be around people, but also after voting on the one plan for the district, we got to do OIP celebrations, and so we've got to see each school highlight a lot of their growth, and so it was all um, data-based, being able to show where they've had growth over the, the last year, um, and the growth was phenomenal which when you add to that, that it was during this year uh, with all of the challenges was amazing. Um, and then after looking at each school's celebrations, then there was also a PBIS showcase where the schools showed off how they are implementing PBIS within their buildings to really change like the culture around behavior and um, responsibility and leadership in each of the, the schools and the classrooms and how they've made it their own. So it was really just a phenomenal uh, morning and experience showcasing all of the work that the, the schools have still had to do over the years just because we were in the middle of a pandemic and trying to figure out how to teach and what modality we're doing. They still had a lot of growth and pieces to, to work through and they did it um, in phenomenal fashion. And Mr. Pistler uh, allowed me to see the, the hallway and the, the building just full of art, which was a bonus to um, that, that DLT morning. So just a phenomenal morning and the growth that the district has had and their, their progress forward. Um, I'm excited to see where we go. Thank you, support services, Mr. Widman. We did not meet. Mr. Widman, continue with the Vanguard Sentinel update. Vanguard Sentinel did meet. Um, things are, are looking good at the Vanguard Sentinel. Uh, as far as next year's uh, numbers seem to be up, uh, uh, specifically at Sentinel with uh, many of the programs uh, at capacity. And so uh, things are going well. Uh, they haven't opened their, their new entryway. They put in a new uh, uh, entryway to improve security ingress and egress from the building. And other than that, everything's good. Very good, thank you. Records committee did not meet. S student representatives have left the building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so moving right along, we have item 602, and then superintendent petition to the public report. The, the only item I have tonight, Dr. Hood and board members, is the uh, handbooks. It's the first read for the elementary preschool middle school and high school handbooks. Um, Mrs. Smith forwarded those to you, I think, oh, a week or so ago uh, to your emails for your, your preview. Um, you'll notice that any of the changes to those handbooks is highlighted in red. Uh, if changes are gonna be made, things will be struck out for you to identify qu uh, quickly what those changes may be. So uh, again, this is just for your first read. Thanks, Bob. I thought you were going to go to the podium and read them to us. Okay, very good. Yeah, Jennifer's been taking care of Mr. Grubbs. One of the uh, obviously hot topics we've had in discussion throughout really most of the year is around busing and the possible possibility of a staggered start for the 21-22 school year uh, with having the elementary start uh, within approximately an hour to hour and 15 minutes after the high school middle school starts. Um, due to several uh, concerned parents, uh, emails, I think many of the board have received several as well. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, Facebook did blow up as well. Uh, and we kind of went back and looked at things and is there a way we can survive one more year? Uh, at this point, we believe we can uh, with that said, being optimistic that we're able to find drivers. Uh, at this point, we still are down four drivers for next school year, and we still need drivers. So anyone who's listening to this tonight, uh, if you're interested in driving a school bus, 
uh, for the Tiffin City Schools, please apply. Um, I think Randy has had this job posted for m several weeks, months, and Scott, I think he said we have one applicant that's not totally qualified, right? Yes, and has not returned phone calls after applying, so. Okay, so we've had one application after this job being posted for several months, uh, so uh, his prayer uh, is that we are not like some other local schools who um, are just doing it with what drivers they have, and many kids are still arriving to school an hour late because they don't have, you know, they can't run a steady bus route uh, because they have to um, use the drivers they have, go out and get kids, and when they get them to school, they go back out and get the kids that wasn't able to be busted at their normal times. Um, we're just praying that we were able to get some drivers to apply and uh, obviously accept some positions. That's going to be the challenge for the uh, district moving forward. And as we talked about before, if Ellis Street Bridge does end up closing for which we are understanding it is, uh, the, again, we could uh, need up to six more drivers to be able to transport that group of kids that will become eligible the following year. So uh, we will still have the same issue uh, the following year and it'll be a tough decision for the board and the community to decide what, what, you know, what we're gonna do. Anything else, Mr. Dub? That's my report. Okay, moving right along. 603, Mr. Daniels report. Yes, uh, I'm doing the summer feeding program and we're basically piggybacking off the summer school uh, program. Uh, we'll be feeding out of the Tiffin Middle School. This year's summer feeding program will be held at the Tiffin Middle School cafeteria. It will run in conjunction with our K-8 summer school program. Students will be fed a hot meal in the cafeteria Monday through Thursday with the ability to take a home, take home a breakfast and lunch for Fridays. We are asking the, our students who are coming to eat lunch not enrolled in the summer school program to call Tiffin City Schools not, at 9 a.m. each morning to order a hot lunch that day. The number to call is 419-447-3358, option three for food service. To go along with our lunch program, students who are free and reduced during the 2019-20 or the 2020-21 will receive a PEBT card for the summer at the daily benefit rate of $6.82 for 55 days, a total of $375 for the summer to help families in need with food this summer. Hey, Dr. Hoda. I do. I was just going to say really quickly, Scott, um, the last year and like the, the stuff that y'all have done with, with food service and throughout all of this has, has been really uh, a feat. And so thank you for your work and your continued work. Um, it, it, there's so much to coordinate there. So you and your, your team have done a phenomenal job. Thank you. Yep. And I just also would like to congratulate my maintenance staff and summer help and other people who jumped in and helped set up for graduation and clean up. Great help. It went very smoothly. Thank you. Item. Eight zero one minutes. 802 Treasurer's Report for April. Three is employment. Read through there. Lots of employment. Four are donation and grants. Five is a statement of purpose of budget purpose budget reports. Six is supplemental appropriations. Seven are various stipends. And we need a motion to approve. So moved. I'll second it. Any discussion? Yeah. 
Andy, we went through the consent agenda, the 807. Um, Dr. McBride made the motion. I seconded it. Is there anywhere that the discussion goes? Mrs. Perry, call the roll. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. Mr. Widman? Abstain. Dr. Gase? Yes. Item 808, employment of summer sweepers. A motion. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Mr. Widman? Abstain. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. Moving on to action item 9.01, adopt the resolution and the membership in OHSAA. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 902, school nurse service agreement. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, call the roll. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Gase? Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 903, approve the school's PLP AP program contract with the NCO ESC. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, call the roll. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 904, approve the NCOESC Education Services Agreement. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, call the roll. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 905, NCOESC program contract. Uh, so moved. For the extended year, extended school year services Second. at PDC. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, call the roll. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 906, approve the amended contract amount for fiscal year 2021 special education services. So moved. Any discussion? Yeah, I think I wanted to say something because the last three items uh, show that uh, our relationship with the Maine Hospital has been set to our ESC has been markedly improved in the last couple of years. And thanks to that relationship, uh, we have some huge burdens taken off our uh, plate. Uh, we can't pass it down to the high school district that we can have those burdens. I'll concur that. It's amazing what they've been able to do for us lately. They're, they're a good group out there. Any further discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 907, approve the Apex Learning subscription. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 908, administrator contract. Mr. Scotty Daniels. So Direc moved. Director of Operations. Second? Second. Mrs. Perry, or I'm sorry, any discussion? Do we want to keep him that long? <laughs> oh. oh, I didn't read that right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 909, another um, administrator contract with Randy Conger. So Super, moved. Superintendent, transportation supervisor. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 9.10, I'll make my, my font larger so I can read it. Uh, 
Tammy Hare, Director of Data Reporting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, call the roll. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gates? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 9.11, Trudy, Mar Trudy Margroff, Food Service Supervisor. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 912, Mr. Forrest Trisler, high school principal. So moved. Second. Any discussion? I'm sorry, who seconded? Dr. Gase. Thank you. Well, I'd like to congratulate him on everything that's being done at the high school. I know he's the leader of that ship and, and, uh, gotten a lot of buy-in from both staff and teachers and students and I'd just like to congratulate him on a job well done. Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 9.13. Mr. Dan Hartzell, Athletic Director. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I'd like to say Any further discussion? Is Mr. Hartzell present? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 9.14. Contractor Mr. William Beeston, Prout Principal. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, call the roll. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 9.15. Contractor Mr. Michael Newlove, Noble 4-5 principal. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Whitman? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Dr. Hoyda? Yes. 9.17. The Medicaid School Program Service Agreement as illustrated in 76 through 84. Dr. Hoyda, you skipped 9.16. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and you would, and you would notice Nothing that Nothing important. <laughs> That's yeah, not important. I would have getting ready. 9.16, <laughs> the five-year forecast with assumptions. Um, Mrs. Perry, would you like to discuss that? Can we get a motion and a second first? <laughs> Who would like to make a motion? Dr. Second. Gase? Second. Dr. McBride, second. Now we can have your discussion. Thank you. All right, and I believe oh, Mr. Gaeta is putting up my PowerPoint. Um, the forecast itself that will be submitted to ODE um, tomorrow, but probably tomorrow, but at least by this Friday as required, is on page 68 of your agenda exhibits, and the assumptions are on pages 69 through 75. So the um, forecast has all updated numbers on it and then on the assumptions what I did was I took November's assumptions and I just added what I changed to each section um, at the bottom of each section you will see bold italics just explaining what was updated so as I said this is required by ODE each November and May so May is the update um, the next slide is forecasted revenues. We'll go over that section first. I'm only showing the revenues from 2021 through 2025, not the historical three years that you can also see on the um, forecast that is exhibited. Those obviously would not change or be updated. The first two lines of revenue are property tax, both from real estate and from public utilities. Um, these have been changed to reflect actual numbers in 2021. 
which then kind of resets what we expect for the future, which is really just constant because normally property taxes will not have significant growth. Um, but the 2021 actual amounts were higher than estimated in November. So those have been updated. Of course, we don't have an income tax. State funding, in 2021, I restored $275,000 of the almost $500,000 that was cut due to the pandemic. So 2021 is updated. And then in 2022 through 2025, I went back and continued the freeze that the governor put in place back in fiscal year 2019. The legislators are working on a new state budget bill um, for 2022 and 2023. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the governor's proposal was completely changed in the House Finance Committees, and now that's being changed by the Senate. I think there have been seven hearings so far in the Senate, so I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Hopefully, I'll find out by June 30th, but until then, I've just gone back to what I know, and that is that um, it was originally frozen at fiscal year 2019 levels. On line 106, all other revenues, um, you'll see a big jump in 2022 from 2021, that is when we start receiving the reimbursements from other districts for the students that are coming in and attending the Tiffin Developmental Center. We are responsible for all of those expenses. Um, we will pay those this year, and then we will be reimbursed next year. And that program is running, um, I think our last bill was about $200,000 just for one month. So that's gonna be a significant reimbursement that's coming in next year from the other districts. I think there are about 20 students. Um, a few of the districts are duplicated, but there's just, there's probably 18 to 20 different districts. On line 206, I only have revenue in 2021 because that's usually a one-time line. Um, 2021 includes one-time rebates from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, which were significant because of the pandemic, and also some ODE refunds for transfers last year that were corrected this year. So I don't show those in every year because those are not guaranteed, they're unreliable. So on the next slide, I just summarized total revenues from 2021 to 2025. You can see even with all the things that I just talked about, there's not a lot of change from one year to the next. Average annual change is only 0.7%. The prior three years was only 0.2%. The next slide is forecasted expenditures. On the first line, 3.01 employees' salaries. And also on 302, I added, that would be benefits. In 2021, I added, or actually I shouldn't say added, I removed $1.6 million from ESSER two monies, and that was part of the CARES Act from the pandemic. ESSER is Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds. Um, ESSER one was already in the forecast in November. I already knew about that. We used that to retain AIDS during the pandemic. Um, we also used it for mental health services and a lot of one-to-one -one devices for the students for technology. Um, but the change from November to now is to remove ESSER two. That was finally approved this past Friday. I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to count on it or not, but we are retaining um, several staff members with that money um, as we are allowed to do. The Tornado Academy teachers, several classroom teachers um, and extracurriculars for this year even during the pandemic. In 2022, I removed staff attrition. There are four teachers and three aides that I know so far that are not being replaced next year. So that's about $350,000 total removed from that year in expenditures. On line 3.03, purchased services. Um, there's not much of a jump usually have inflation on this line. If you look across, you can see that that increases um, more than most of the other lines in the forecast. But 2022, 
um, does not increase as much because I'm not including the satellite classes um, from Sentinel. There are two of those at the high school. Um, there was low enrollment there, so that was a significant cost, but I'm not carrying that forward in 2022. And also I'm going to spend out our final student wellness and success funds um, from this past biennium. And then after that, once those, um, once the student wellness and success funds are not available anymore, then you'll see 2023 jump much more. Supplies and materials is high in 2021 because we have some carryovers in technology and curriculum. I'm just gonna assume that those are gonna be spent by June 30th. If they're not, then that a lot of that expense will carry over to 2022. And then it remains rather steady with the budgets that we have. 305 capital outlay, the same thing in 2021. We've got some carryovers from technology that I'm going to assume are being spent. If not, they will carry over into 2022. Um, but otherwise we normally just have the regular technology budget and a small amount for band instruments. On line 501, operating transfers out. That line includes about $130,000 for um, student supplies that used to be um, paid for with student fees. So I will have to transfer money into that fund at the end of each year. Also about $5,000 for the International Cultural Center and about $55,000 for the principal and interest for a House Bill 264 loan that we used to um, complete energy improvements. And I believe most of that was lighting. Um, we used to just include that on a different line, but the auditors asked that I start transferring it out and accounting for it in a separate fund. On the next slide, you can then see the summary of total expenditures. And the average annual change over the five years is an increase of 4%. The prior three years increased 6% on the average. And most of that, or not most of that, but the um, higher increase was due to the salaries that we increased each year, where I'm not projecting that um, after 2022 in this forecast because that's not been negotiated yet. So I only increase for steps, not for base increases. The next slide shows expenditures exceeding revenues in all five years, going from an estimated $670,000 deficit spending this year to $5 million in 2025. And of course, that's gonna happen because of the um, revenues and expenditures increasing at such different rates. Revenues are only increasing 0.7%, while expenditures are gonna increase 4% annually. So obviously, deficit spending is gonna continue to accelerate. The next slide shows forecasted changes in the fund balances. So I'll start with that deficit spending on the very first line, 6.01. Those are the same figures. And then um, jump down to 10.01 and 12.01. These are the same amounts because I don't have any replacement or renewal levies in between there. But this is the amount that um, we certify appropriations each year, contracts, salary schedules, and other obligations so we need to keep those amounts positive or we cannot certify any spending. So the state will expect us to correct that. And then the bottom line, 1501, unreserved cash balance on June 30th is the same because I am not showing any new income tax or property taxes in the forecast. That doesn't mean that we can't propose them, but at this particular time, we do not have anything set. The next slide shows those ending carryover balances at the bottom. Um, from 2021 to 2025, we go from $14.2 million down to a negative $2.1 million. Now, one thing I wanna point out is all of the unknowns right now. The state's budget bill for the next biennium, 2022 and 2023, as I said, that's currently in legislation. The first, proposal that came out was from the governor, and it was to continue student wellness and success funds, which those are not put in the forecast as revenue, they're removed as expenditures and accounted for in a separate fund. That's how we've had to do them the last two years. But he proposed $2.2 million over two years 
um, based on our qualifying expenditures, I will show you a scenario where I can remove about $560,000 a year for the next four years because those are restricted for specific items such as school nurse, school resource officer, mental health, guidance counselors. Um, the, that his proposal then went to the house and they took the student wellness and success funds and said they would just incorporate them with the fair school funding plan. Well, somehow in that plan and incorporating those, um, what they came up with was that we would receive $2.2 million increase in state funding, including student wellness and success, but it wouldn't happen for six years. So we wouldn't see the full amount until 2027, which isn't even in this five-year forecast. Um, they will phase it in. And in the first year, fiscal year 2022, we would only get 99,000. And then they would start to phase it in um, at greater increments until they got to 2.2 million in 2027. But that then went to the Senate. That's been through seven hearings, as I said earlier. I have not seen any simulations on what we expect from them. The other unknown is ESSER $3. So we've already received and spent ESSER 1. We just got ESSER 2 approved this past Friday, and I'm gonna use that to reimburse retaining staff this year. ESSER 3 is $2.4 million. It can be used from now until 2024, 20% 20 of it, or 490,000, has to be used for evidence-based methods to counter learning loss. And then the other 80%, $1.9 million, is basically the same allowable uses as the first two ESSER funds. So those are the unknowns that I don't have in this forecast yet, because I can't count on any of them. ESSER 3, we've gotten our allocation, but we have to go through an application process over the summer, um, which we will do that. Um, and then they will review that and award that. So I should have that answer for the November forecast. The next slide is the ending operating cash equivalent in um, days or months. So um, whatever, well, I showed you what our ending balances were on that previous slide. Here, I'm just converting it to how many months of operations will that cover? Um, in 2021, we have five months. 2022 is down to four. 23 is down to three months. 2024 is down to one month. And then 2025 is negative three weeks. Treasurers usually prefer six months of cash in the bank for operations, um, but we like to see a minimum of three. If we start dropping that low, low, then we know that it's definitely time to start talking about a levy, which we've already obviously done because we were making these projections back in November. The last slide is just um, my contact information, my phone number, um, and two websites, ours and the Ohio Department of Education, so that the public or anyone will be able to find um, the forecast and the assumptions on once I get them submitted. Right now, the November forecast will be on those sites. The other thing that I gave board members is um, scenarios, and these should look familiar to you. These are what we used last fall when we were trying to decide what to do about a levy, and of course a lot has changed since then. The levy has failed. We have these unknowns that I've talked about and the changes that I've made to the forecast. So the first scenario that you're looking at is scenario number one. You'll see that on line one. I've labeled each one of them so that you can keep track of them. But the first one is, this just mimics the forecast. Um, so this is my base that I'm using for each scenario. Line 30 shows the ending balance, negative $2 million in 2025. Line 35 shows the number of cash days that we are short shooting for that three month minimum or 90 days. So you can see how many days we have to make up. And then line 68 shows deficit spending, which of course is every year of the forecast. Scenario number two, I show this with the 6.9 mils that we had proposed last year 
um, and just failed this month. So if we would be able to pass 6.9 mills in this calendar year yet, so it would have to be in November, add that revenue in on line nine, which when it's fully collecting one year is almost $2.9 million. You can see how that affects line 30, the ending balance, it's positive all the way through with almost $8 million in 2025. The reserved cash days were only short 13 days below that desired 90 in 2025. We have the minimum up until then. Um, line 68, we still have deficit spending every year though, but it's much less. And then on line 78, you can see what it costs the owner of a $100,000 home, $242. Scenario number three, I just dropped the millage down to 4.9 just to see what that would look like. That's um, the last levy that we passed was that amount. Um, so I'm adding that in on line nine. That would collect a total of $2 million when it's collecting a full year. Line 30. Ending balance is positive in all years, ending at five million in 2025. Line 35, we're just short three days for our minimum cash days in 2024, short 41 days in 2025. Line 68, you can see that deficit spending still occurs in every year. Obviously it's gonna be higher than the 6.9 mils and the cost to a homeowner is $172 per year for a $100,000 home. Scenario number four, I show a 0.75% traditional income tax because that we had determined that, that was comparable to the 6.9 mils when we were making that decision. So line 10, I'm adding in revenue. That starts collecting at a lower, slower rate in 2022. Um, but by 2024 and, of course, 2025, it's fully collecting at $3.1 million a year. So line 30, all ending balances are positive. 35, we are not below our minimum cash days until 2025. We're almost a month short. On line 68, we still have deficit spending every year. And on line 79, the cost to a $40,000 traditional income earner is $300 a year. Scenario number five, I did a 1% earned income tax that was the closest that was comparable to the 6.9 mils and the 0.75% traditional tax. On line 11, I add 3.5 million in 2024 and 2025 when it's fully collecting. Line 30, all ending balances are positive with 7.5 million in 2025. Line 35, we are 17 days below the desired minimum, cash days, line 68, deficit spending still occurs in every year. And on line 80, I prorated um, the cost to um, someone making $40,000 in traditional income because only earned income is gonna be taxed. I prorated that at $333, but that's gonna vary greatly depending on the individual. Um, I just prorated it based on the yield that those two different types of taxes would bring in. Scenario number six is um, no levies. The governor's student wellness and success proposal on line 18, I'm adding in that $566,000 a year over four years. So you can see how that affects line 30. Um, every Ending balance is positive, but it drops down to 129,000 in 2025. Reserved cash days, we are below our minimum in 2024 and 2025, we're almost down to zero. Yep, we have one day. On line 68, we have deficit spending in every year. Scenario number seven is adding in the house um, version of the fair school funding plan. And on line 12, you can see that in 2022, I added $99,000. And then I, 2023, I think was simulated at 260,000, but then 2024 and 2025, I just incrementally increased those. Those are actually in the next biennium budget. Um, so I really don't know how they'll 
increment those, I'm just prorating them to try to get to that 2.2 million by 2027. So on line 30, positive ending balances, but only $214,000 left in 2025. Line 35, we are, are below our desired minimum in 2023, and we are down to just two days of operating cash in 2025. On line 68, deficit spending in every year. The last scenario is um, adding in the 80% of the ESSER 3 that we will be applying for this summer. And I'm just adding in 80% because the other 20% has to be for um, learning losses. So that would be new expenditures that would I would not be able to remove from the forecast. So on line 19, I add 1.9 million in, and I did it all in 2022, um, but we have to have it spent by 2024 if we receive it. So you can see how that affects the ending balance on line 30. It's positive until we get to uh, year 2025, 168,000 negative. On line 35, we are short our desired cash days in 2024 and 2025 is negative, and on line 68, deficit spending in every year. So I know that that's a lot of scenarios. I did them individually because I don't know, you know, we could end up with a combination of this, um, and we will have to make a decision then on what we wanna do with the levy. So um, I didn't put any of them together. There's honestly just too many unknowns right now as far as the forecast goes. Um, once that, biennial budget is passed. If it's done by June 30th, let's hope so. Um, I can do a revision and I might be able to resubmit that in July, depending on the states, um, what, what they decide they're gonna do with allowing us to do that. If I can't resubmit it this summer, I can just redo it in November as required. So the only other thing that I gave you, I believe is the election filing deadlines for the November ballot, we would need to file everything with the Board of Elections by August 4th, which traditionally would mean that we pass our first resolution in June and the second one in July, um, but we could do them both in July at a special board meeting if we need to. On the back side of that are the deadlines for 2022, so for May 3rd, the Board of Elections deadline is February 2nd, which would traditionally mean passing the first resolution in December of this year, and then the second one in January next year. That's a lot of information. Any questions? Yes, Megan. Yes. <laughs> it is a lot of information, and I appreciate you putting this all together. Um, so I just want to be sure that I'm synthesizing this correctly. It looks like we have decreased expenditures by 2% per year. Is that accurate? I think that's accurate. We were at 6% increasing expenditures and now we're at 4%. Oh, yes, yep. So we've, we've decreased expenditures and then it looks like even with all of these unknowns with each scenario that could all change, mm -hmm. even if we got these funds, we're still looking at deficit spending and a need to do something. So with decreasing expenditures and possible funding from the state, we still need to do something. Is yes. That, I'm synthesizing all of that accurately. Yes, and, and just remember that, that that decrease in the um, expenditure growth, remember that I, I don't have any negotiated salary increases included in this. That's so, awful. Yeah. No, thank you for reminding me that. Okay, thank you. So you think it's just uh, roughly 2% uh, inflation? It depends on the line. Um, for salaries, yes, it's about 2%. Purchase services, I have a much higher inflation because those are much more difficult to control um, depending on student services, where students are placed. A lot of times we can't control those expenses. Could I ask that um, the next time you present something like this on the revenue side, you factor in inflation also, please? So declining 2% every year? Okay. Because mm -hmm. it is the value of, the, of that levy declines 2% every year. Because 
it's not inflation proof. Right. Right. So, so every year we decline, we get two percent less. It it should remain stagnant. We will see a no, little no, bit of dollar growth. value. Yes, the dollar. Right. Yes, the dollar. But but the purchasing power is right. down two percent. Yes, every year. you are. Yes. If you're factoring in two percent rise in expenditure, well, factoring in two percent loss in in income too. I think that's appropriate so that we know what the, the reality is. Yeah, and I'm just showing the, the cash value of I understand, the but, levy but I think receipts. maybe just put it in parentheses at the top so that we can actually look at this and say, okay, apples to apples, this is what we're up against. So when we go to the public, you know, we know that, hey, it's not exactly, you know, a sad number there. It's a mm -hmm. declining number every year, unless there's no inflation, of course, right. which is going to happen because it's built in. So I think I'd, I'd like to see a number up there that, that reflects that, so that I can, in my mind, know the actual differential. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then I have another question. Uh, the ESSER funds, where are they located in this? I don't see the 1.6 million anywhere. They're difficult to see because I'm removing those expenditures because I have to account for them in a separate fund, and that is required by the state. Well, that's something um, about hocus pocus, though. I know. Treasures I mean, um, how can we tried know? to advocate that we could put those receipts, student wellness and success funds, ESSER funds, that we could put those in our forecast. But ODE said the only way you can do it is to remove the expenditures. Transfer the expenditures to a separate fund. I can't transfer the receipts from federal funds into my general operating fund. I can only transfer expenses. So once again, we're hiding the fact that we otherwise would lose some uh, additional employees. Well, I don't want to say we're hiding. It no, no, like I, yeah, we are. It's not in there. But he's so following, it's hidden. He's following I understand, exactly the but state's I'm not saying yeah. she's hiding it. I'm saying the process is hiding it. I would like to see that. Yeah, it would be a much easier process for me if I could just put well, the revenue. I still <laughs> think we need to see it because yeah. otherwise, once again, we're being diluted. We're being, mm -hmm. you, know, the, the, you know, hocus pocus, hey, don't worry about these positions that would have otherwise been lost. Mm -hmm. and, and the state is going to say to you this time, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Maybe the next month they'll say, oh, sorry, those funds aren't going to come after all. So, so I think the public needs to know that when we're dealing with the state, it is a hocus pocus thing. And so when we come to them for money, we're asking them to, to pony up because that's the only reliable source that we're going to have. Mm -hmm. What was the ESSER 1 total? ESSER 1 was 499000 And what was ESSER 2? ESSER 2, 1.6 million. Yes, ESSER 3 could be? ESSER 3 could be 2.4 million. It, uh, Mr. Grubbs, do you remember what was the original ESSER 3? The original ESSER 3 was 4.1. It went down to 3.6, and we were actually relying on the 3.6, and when they came out, uh, what was it, Friday, the, the 2.4. With a question mark. <laughs> yes. Okay. But at least it's in a budget right now that was presented to us through our CCIP, which is usually pretty reliable that that's what it will be. Mm -hmm. Although we found out on Monday, even after ESSER 2 was approved, that we had a reduction of $12,000. Not that it was a huge amount of money, but it was a reduction after it was already approved. So just to clarify, Sharon, then what you did is like in 2021 forecast of expenditures, you reduced those expenditures expenditures by the amount of the SR2 money. And that's Correct. why it looks like our expenditures go from 14 million to 60 million in one, one year. Correct. And that's where I think Danny gets to the point of, you know, somebody looks at this and says, oh my goodness, you you're spending two mo two million dollars more than you did the previous year. What's going on? Well, it's because we had to take some of that out that was paid differently. I, I think one of the, uh, Chris, uh, Mr. Woodman, I think one of the uh, places that you really see that number that when it jumps out to you uh, from one of these forecasts to another, uh, use, I'll just use the example number eight. Uh, if you look at 2022, and if you compare any other sheet of 2022 with that line 68 you'll see the deficit spending is reduced by the amount of the ESSER dollars. 
I think that that's the one that jumps out and says, okay, they must be using that uh, care. Um, not that I, I, I would agree with Dr. Gase, it does seem like we're, <laughs> okay, where's this money at and where's it going? How did it get there? I think this is my 44th forecast as a treasurer. It's one of the most challenging ones because I don't recall that there have ever been this many unknowns. It, it, it makes it extremely difficult to try and convey this in a simple fashion mm -hmm. to a public when even the professionals are scratching their heads. It's, it's a, next to impossible. Mm -hmm. Hopefully things will be clear for November um, but we, we do have a timing issue with trying to decide what to do about a levy. I appreciate your diligence in this and like the ever fluctuating mysterious mm -hmm. numbers. So thank you. Now do you see why I tried to skip over you? <laughs> <laughs> starting to think I wish you would have. <laughs> Dr. Gase. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Mr. Widman. Yes. Dr. Hoyda. Yes. Moving right along, 9.17, approve the Medicaid school program service agreement. Need a motion, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Dr. Hoyda. Yes. 9.18, approve the workers' compensation group retrospective rating program. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Dr. Hoyda. Yes. 9.19, we approve the Bascom Communication Service Contract. So moved. Second. Miss, any discussion? And what was what was the savings through that again? $20. Uh, oh, go oh, ahead. Scotty, uh, uh, $20 say. a month. $20 a month. Okay. Well, and I think it's, it's more than the savings. Uh, Tim, Tim jumped in here, uh, I asked him earlier, and really being able to get actually fiber lines to the bus ride mm -hmm. instead of the old copper lines and the ability to do other things that will make us more efficient in our business. Yeah, the current phone lines, when we switch over to VIP phones, uh, okay. would crash. Very good. Okay, Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Dr. Hoyda. Yes. 920, approve a settlement agreement. So, so second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Dr. Hoyda. Yes. 921. Rescind a non renewal. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mrs. Perry, please call the roll. Mr. Widman. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Dr. Hoyda. Yes. We've reached second opportunity for the public to dialogue with the board. Would any of the public members like to dialogue with us? Seeing we're still as popular as we were as we was before, as we were before, we'll move on to item 11. Any board discussion? Um, I just wanted to echo um, what Dr. Hoyt has said and talk about graduation. That was my first graduation in person, and I just, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Chris asked me when I got in uh, this afternoon my thoughts on it, and I just, that's a really cool um, honor to be able to be a part of. So it was my first, and it was wonderful. Uh, Scott, again, you and your crew, and Mr. Trisler, you and your crew, it was, it was really um, wonderful to be in that space uh, and to get to celebrate just all the work of our students and their families and our staff. So thank you. I think, um, Forrest, first of all, uh, more than one person has uh, commended uh, you for the 61-minute uh, graduation ceremony, and uh, that's fabulous. That many people coming through uh, 
about half the time of the average graduation service. Um, but I think um, given that we don't have baccalaureate any longer, um, assuming we're not going to in the future, uh, might we consider a morning um, graduation ceremony? Mr. Grubbs has already proposed that to Mr. Swistler. Uh, 10 a.m. Uh, graduation, get everyone home so they can have their parties all afternoon and not uh, interrupt their evening. So I think Mr. Swistler is at least considering it. One concern that kind of has to creep in just a little bit on that, if we continue to host regional track meet, depending on what weekend, we need a little more time than 10 a.m. if there's a huge amount of cleanup from the night before for that. So that's just a consideration, just where it falls on calendars. And I know we did have uh, at least two graduating seniors participating in, uh, is it the district track meet? That uh, they would have missed, uh, they would have missed the graduation had it been in the morning. I mean, it just, because um, they were running, I think one might have been at noon and the other one if I'm not mistaken, we did have Sunday morning graduation at one point, or earlier in the day, maybe 2 o'clock back quite some time ago. So. I think a lot of schools do a Sunday, like a 1, 2 o'clock. Yep. do want to, uh, if, if we move on, I don't mean to force the move on, but the uh, Northwest Ohio School Board Association, our uh, regional director, is resigning at the end of this month, so we'll be involved in hiring a new uh, regional. Dr. Judy May has done a fabulous job over the last 18 years. Uh, she has uh, resigned her position at the end of this month, so we'll be looking for uh, a new uh, a new regional person to, to help guide the Ohio School Board Association. And uh, another interesting thing that has come up at the uh, statewide level is something I was uh, very unaware of, and it's called the critical race theory. And so it is not something I have much knowledge on, but I am learning it's very con con uh, controversial. And so, um, again, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge on it. All I know is it's shaken some things up in different districts. So interestingly enough, this is actually an area that I, I do have lots of experience in and actually it's one that I, I teach in my coursework at, at Heidelberg. And so these conversations are, are ones that I'm actively involved in both at a, um, a state and a national advocacy level. Um, so it's been interesting to see it hit Ohio and some of the conversations that have been had at other districts. Uh, there were a few school board meetings I know last night where it, it came up um, so if anybody wants to have a conversation about it or about the different theories and some of those pieces, I'm delighted to engage in those, have a cup of coffee, all those pieces, because it's, it's definitely a piece that, that I teach in my nearly everyday work. Oh, wow. Very good. Anyone else? I would just like to, one final piece, welcome all the, what, 174? 174 graduates new members of the Alumni uh, Association of Christian Columbia over the 150 plus years. Um, Forrest did a great job at uh, making the, the weather be perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, nice little breeze to keep things cool. And uh, everything went well. It was, it was really, it's, it's a rewarding time and very fun. It was fun to see the, the graduates uh, behave for the most part. And, mm -hmm. uh, very enjoyed leaving. We have no need for an executive session. That is correct. Okay. Seeing there is none, we will adjourn. The board business is concluded. We need a... So moved. Second. Mr. Perry, call the roll. Dr. Gates? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Mr. Widman? Yes. Dr. Hoida? Yes. Our next meeting will be on June 22nd, 6 o'clock in the cafeteria. Thank you and have a great week.